There were slaves in every one of the 13 original colonies. You know. So a narrative of a search for freedom and liberty is immediately qualified, but what about these slaves you have around you? you know. The state that had the largest number of slaves outside of the South, outside of Georgia, second most largest, New York. New York. You know. This is not a down there phenomenon. You can say, well, I'm from North, you know, slavery was down there somewhere. No, no, slavery was here. You know. You know. And a mythology you know, that tries to make racism something somewhere else robs you of your understanding of your relationship to that history. You know, disarms you and your ability to function in the world you know, with the antagonism that you see before you. you know, and it's just part of the cost. Right? The political cost after the American Revolution. The majority of slaves in the American Revolution fought for the British. Why? Because a monarchy promised to give abolition to those that fought. The patriots Fighters for liberty did not. Right? So if I'm a slave and have a choice of who I'm going to run away and fight for, I'm fighting with Lord Dunsmore in South Carolina. I'm fighting with the British, right? not with George Washington, a slaveholder, or Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, or Patrick Henry, a slaveholder. Give me liberty or give me death. What about me? Great slogan, right? The failure to extend that ideology right, throughout the society calls that ideology into question. Yeah. It's beginning cause to racism, it's hypocrisy. Yeah. You have a democratic Republican constitution. Well, first of all, democracy can't be democracy if half of the population, females, are put in a box and set over there somewhere. Like, we're not even talking about them yet. Let's not even talk democracy, we're talking about human beings. Democracy means like men, you know, and white men, and white men with property, you know. So, just the notion of democracy, you know, is like a narrow, narrow, finite notion at the beginning. And this is built into the Constitution right? when the country is set up, you know. And to handle this problem, we set up one of the great quarter systems of all time, which is to say the House and the Senate. You know, people talk about they don't believe in quotas and affirmative action is quotas. The U.S. Senate is a quota system. Every state gets two senators, regardless of population. Is that fair? Rhode Island and Texas are equal. North Dakota and California are equal. 400,000 white people in North Dakota have the same number of senators as 20 million people that live in California. It's a quota system. <coughs> people don't object to that one. I've heard a word about that one. Right? So a fundamental inequality was built into the Constitution at the beginning. <coughs> Why? To handle the problem of what? Slaves. Right? We were here as property. We were brought here as property. Right? But when it came time to count people in terms of representation in the house, we became people all of a sudden. The same people that owned us and kept us on a list with horses and cows, you know, barrels of molasses, discovered when it came time to get political representation, we were people and should be counted for purposes of representation. Right? Well, since the founding fathers were wise men, we got the discount, three-fifths. We weren't whole people, we got we were 60%, 40% off. Right? So in fact, built into the Constitution is everybody's people except black people who get 40% off. Right? How do you walk around the world and talk about democracy when the Constitution says that? The Constitution says that. It's not an add-on, it's the original. Right? What does this ensure? Right? Non-democratic representation in the national government of slaveholders. First presidents, Supreme Court justices, right? a national policy right? that pursues slavery as a policy while talking freedom. Right? 
all of the major wars in this country down to the Civil War. I fought to extend slavery. Yeah. The most expensive war before the Civil War was the war with the Seminoles, Florida, Alabama, swamps. Why? Slaves were running away, hiding among the native population. Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Cherokees, Seminoles. The native populations were fighting to maintain their freedom and their independence to keep those slaves with them as free people. This country spent $40 million fighting to exterminate Native Americans in the eastern part of the United States. When they couldn't exterminate, they shipped the Cherokee, the five civilized tribes they call them, on the Trail of Tears in 1842 out to the west, Oklahoma, reservations. They confined the Seminoles, who are still at war technically with the United States, into the Everglades in Florida. <coughs> it's the most expensive war this country fought before the Civil War. Not about freedom, but to extend slavery. Right. It's the next war before the Civil War, Mexican War. Remember the Alamo? Let's not remember the Alamo. <laughs> they have yet to make a movie about the Alamo. They made another one trying to clean it up a little bit. Where's the movie that says that Jim Bridges, a slaveholder? David Crockett's a slaveholder. Sam Houston is a slaveholder. Stephen A. Austin is a slaveholder. They are fighting to expand slavery into Mexico because Mexico had abolished slavery. Santa Ana may have been a dictator, but there was no slavery in Mexico, and slaves were running away from the South into Mexico to be free. I have a quick question for you. Now, between a man and a woman, or rather a white man and a white woman, who do you think is racist? Or between a black woman and a black man, who do you think is more racist? And why is it that when... Um, when people are speaking about good and bad, it is always separated between black people and white people. Uh, people think that black people are bad even before they do anything wrong, and this mostly happens in white nations. Now, there has been what we call white privilege, prejudice, racism, and how the society has cultivated the norm of perception, perception based on stereotypes. This is a video we are going to watch, and then I'll share with you my thoughts. Let's dive in. Uh. What I want to talk about, they asked me to talk uh, long about Black History Month. And in most cases, when you talk, you talk about the achievements of African Americans and but things uh, that people don't know about what African Americans have done. Uh, but what I find is more effective in, in the recent years is to try to explain to white Americans what racism has caused them. Uh, most people really aren't that concerned about you know, at a fundamental level about the disadvantages that, that are placed upon African Americans. Uh, a lot of people rationalize those, those disadvantages or don't want to deal with them, you know. So I've always found it more effective to say that, that racism is not free for anybody, you know. And that you pay the price, you know, for what has happened to African American people, that you're not getting off scot-free. Uh, and that if you still believe in white supremacy or any hints of white supremacy, and are not at the absolute top of the social structure, you ought to go looking for somebody to be mad at. Right? Because the, the benefits of being a white person are like shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, to be an ordinary white person, a regular white person, you know, not a wealthy, rich white person. And so the payoff for white supremacy, you know, the clientele for that payoff is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, and in a sense, the majority of the white American population is dropping down to where black people are, you know, which is to say your unemployment rate, you know, your living conditions, your level of debt, you know, your level of social anxiety is coming down to where we are. You know. And I would like to say welcome to the club <laughs> or misery loves company, uh, but I would prefer to think that once you comprehend that, there'll be a possibility of more joint action to correct that situation. You know, and it raises, it's not just something that affects us, you know, as black people, it affects you, you know. And the failure of this nation to deal with that in the past has consequences for you, you know. 
And I'll briefly give you a sweeping overview of how this came about, and then I'll narrow down on how, in fact, this impacts on you, uh, on you today. Uh, virtually every discussion of American history, every part of the national narrative that you've been taught immediately gets qualified or disqualified once you bring in the reality of the African-American experience. That's why there was always such a, a widespread resistance to the teaching of the African-American experience. Uh, every national mythology, you know, every slogan, right, every, you know, song you sing, land of the free, home of the brave, when you say, what about black people, you have to start qualifying. In some cases, you have to throw it totally out. This is a democracy. What about slavery? You know, we all created equal. What about Jim Crow? You know, we can rise as far as you can based on your individual merits. What about discrimination, disenfranchisement, quotas? You know, every single thing, every single other part of the national mythology has to be called into question when you bring in the African American experience. And this is not something new, this is at the beginning, the foundations of the country. You know, the mythology of Puritans landing at Plymouth Rock. You know, colonists seeking religious freedom in Virginia. You know, they're trekking slaves with them all the way. The first state, the first state, the first commonwealth to make slavery legal was Massachusetts. Not Georgia, not Virginia, not South Carolina, Massachusetts. Right? There were slaves in every one of the 13 original colonies. You know. So a narrative of a search for freedom and liberty is immediately qualified, but what about these slaves you have around you? You know, the state that had the largest number of slaves outside of the South, outside of Georgia, second most largest, New York. New York. You know, this is not a down there phenomenon. You say, well, I'm from North, you know, slavery was down there somewhere. No, no, slavery was here. You know, you know. and a mythology, you know, that tries to make racism something somewhere else robs you of your understanding of your relationship to that history. You know, disarms you and your ability to function in the world you know, with the antagonism that you see before you. you know, and it's just part of the cost. Right? The political cost after the American Revolution. The majority of slaves in the American Revolution fought for the British. Why? Because a monarchy promised to give abolition to those that fought. The patriots, you know, fighters for liberty, did not. Right? So if I'm a slave and have a choice of who I'm going to run away and fight for, I'm fighting with Lord Dunsmore in South Carolina. I'm fighting with the British, right? not with George Washington, a slaveholder, or Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder or Patrick Henry, a slaveholder. Give me liberty or give me death. What about me? Great slogan. Right? The failure to extend that ideology right, throughout this society calls that ideology into question. Yeah. It's beginning cost to racism, it's hypocrisy. You have a democratic, republican constitution. Well, first of all, democracy can't be democracy if half of the population, females, are put in a box and set over there somewhere. Like, we're not even talking about them yet. Let's not even talk democracy, we're talking about human beings. Democracy means, like, men, you know, and white men, and white men with property, you know. So just the notion of democracy, you know, is like a narrow, narrow, finite notion at the beginning. And this is built into the Constitution. When the country is set up, you know. And to handle this problem, we set up one of the great quarter systems of all time, which is to say the House and the Senate. You know. People talk about they don't believe in quotas and affirmative action is quotas. The US Senate is a quota system. Every state gets two senators, regardless of population. Is that fair? Rhode Island and Texas are equal. North Dakota and California are equal. 400,000 white people in North Dakota have the same number of senators as 20 million people that live in California. It's a quota system. <coughs> people don't object to that one. I've heard a word about that one. Right? 
So a fundamental inequality was built into the Constitution at the beginning. Why? To handle the problem of what? Slaves. Right? We were here as property. We were brought here as property. Right? But when it came time to count people in terms of representation in the House, we became people all of a sudden. The same people that owned us and kept us on a list with horses and cows you know, barrels of molasses discovered when it came time to get political representation, we were people and should be counted for purposes of representation. Right? Well, since the founding fathers were wise men, we got the discount. Three fifths. We weren't whole people, we got we were sixty percent, forty percent off. <laughs> right? So in fact, built into the Constitution is everybody's people except black people who get 40% off, right? How do you walk around the world and talk about democracy when the Constitution says that? The Constitution says that. It's not an add-on. It's the original, right? What does this ensure, right? Non-democratic representation in the national government of slaveholders. First presidents. Supreme Court justices, right? A national policy right, that pursues slavery as a policy while talking freedom, right? All of the major wars in this country down to the Civil War are fought to extend slavery. You know, the most expensive war before the Civil War was the war with the Seminoles, Florida, Alabama, Swamps. Why? Slaves were running away, hiding among the native population. Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Cherokees, Seminoles. The native populations were fighting to maintain their freedom and their independence to keep those slaves with them as free people. This country spent $40 million fighting to exterminate Native Americans in the eastern part of the United States. When they couldn't exterminate, they shipped the Cherokee, the five civil last tribes, they call them, on the Trail of Tears in 1842 out to the west, Oklahoma, reservations. They confined the Seminoles, who are still at war technically with the United States, into the Everglades in Florida. It's the most expensive war this country fought before the Civil War. Not about freedom, but to extend slavery. Right. It's the next war before the Civil War. Mexican War. Remember the Alamo? Let's not remember the Alamo. <laughs> they have yet to make a movie about the Alamo. They made another one trying to clean it up a little bit. Where's the movie that says that Jim Bridges, a slaveholder? David Crockett's a slaveholder. Sam Houston is a slaveholder. Stephen A. Austin is a slaveholder. They are fighting to expand slavery into Mexico because Mexico had abolished slavery. Santa Ana may have been a dictator, but there was no slavery in Mexico, and slaves were running away from the South into Mexico to be free. Freedom-loving Texans carrying their slaves into Mexico said, you cannot bring these people here. We don't have slavery. What's the response to declare Texas independent? Not for freedom, but to expand slavery. Make that movie. Put Denzel in that one. <laughs> you know, as a slave who had run away and is fighting in the Mexican army at the Alamo. That's the movie. Black people in the Mexican army at the Alamo fighting slaveholders. Make that movie. The cost of racism is you don't know what happened in this country. You glorify slaveholders as heroes because you don't know they're slaveholders. You're not taught that. You walk around in complete ignorance of that. Right. You have political leadership in the 19th century that ignored slavery. Right. The people that said abolish slavery, we are taught are fanatics. 
William Lord Garrison, all fanatical abolitionists, all fanatic, fanatic. John Brown, oh, he's crazy. John Brown, oh, he's crazy. He's crazy. Oh, no, crazy. Crazy. No, no. What did Garrison believe? Slavery was wrong. Should be abolished. Why does that make you crazy? Why is that a sign of lunacy? Why is Tom Jefferson not crazy for owning his slaves? And William Lord Garrison's crazy for wanting to abolish slavery. What you teach in your books? You know, look at the paragraph on William Lord Garrison in any textbook you got. See what they say about it. And John Brown. What did John Brown want to do? John Brown believed in direct action. He was a good American. Got a problem, solve it. How do you solve the problem of slavery? John Brown said, well, it's very simple. You kill all the slaveholders. <laughs> That's the American way, right? That's why we have the largest military in the world. When we have a problem, kill it. Right? <laughs> you don't like something, kill it. Right? That's why we got this massive military. Right? You got drop bombs on it. John Brown was an American. He said, we have a problem, slavery, kill it. They said, oh, no, 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 he's crazy. Why is he crazy? Well, he started to do it. Went to Kansas, Kansas and Nebraska, to stop the expansion of slavery by killing slaveholders. Guess who caught him? Robert E. Lee at Harper's Ferry in the Union Army. And they told John Brown they were going to hang him. John said, I understand. I lost. I didn't, you know, I didn't win. And his last words were, he said, do you regret what you did? He said, you know, the problem was we didn't kill enough people. He said, I made a mistake because I thought we could solve this problem by killing a few slaveholders. He said, it's, we're going to have to purge this land with blood before we end slavery. Now you would think that somebody listening to that would say, slavery is a problem, let us end it and solve this problem. Nobody did. What happens two years after John Brown is dead? Fort Sumter, the Civil War. There are more casualties, dead and wounded, in the Civil War then in all the American wars combined, all of them, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Spanish-American War, and the numbers in Iraq. More in the US Civil War to abolish slavery than in all the wars this country fought combined. No. But if you had said to white Americans, give me a million lives to free the slaves, they said, no, I'm not doing that. But to ignore slavery, cost a million lives. Right. To not have compensated emancipation, if you had in the West Indies. Right. To ignore racism, right. cost almost a million white people their lives. Not black people, we was, they wouldn't even let us in the army. You know, there were only 200,000 black people that had to fight their way into the army to fight. Right. They had to demand the right to fight. Then they wouldn't even pay them equal wages. So he said, don't pay us anything. The 54th and 55th turned back to pay. They said, we can't pay you what we pay white people because you're not good enough. And besides, you're black. They said, don't pay us anything. We'll fight for free. Right. <coughs> for free. It cost a million white people their lives. And over a million white people their limbs and their arms. Over slavery. But if you had put that on the table, nobody would have bought it. But the failure to deal with slavery, that's the price white people pay you know, for looking the other way, for ignoring it, saying, well, it's not my problem. We'll deal with it next year sometime. Right? So you think maybe people would learn right, after slavery is over. All black people say, well, let's forget about the past. Don't dwell on slavery. Can we have the minimum to live as Americans? We worked for over 250 years with no compensation. Can we have just 40 acres, small farm, and one mule to work it? No. 
No, can't have it. Son of America, you're free now, you're on your own. Well, what about back pay? No, no, you're not entitled to anything. You're free, you're on your own. And so black Americans tried to put their lives together as ex-slaves and made the most remarkable transitions in American democracy this country seen. The first public schools in the South were put in their place by Reconstruction governments dominated by ex-slaves. Free public education for everybody. You had no public schools in the South because to educate white Southerners would be the slaves might hear something and learn something, therefore nobody gets educated. Right? The price of keeping black people dumb is to keep white people just as dumb. <laughs> and they're proud of it. At least they're not black. Right? That's why even today, when you think high education, great schools, you don't think Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Right. Some of those places didn't get mandatory school attendance until the 1970s. 1970s, you didn't have to go to school. It wasn't a law that said you had to go to school in Mississippi to the 1970s. White or black. You know. Black people set up the public state universities in the South during Reconstruction. University of South Carolina. First president was a black man, Richard T. Greener. University of Mississippi. University of Georgia. For everybody, not just for themselves, for everybody. White people looked at those, threw the black people out, said, this is barbarism. We can't have this. Like, put them out. And then they kept the schools. They didn't say the schools are bad. They said, you can't have them. They hadn't thought of it themselves. And then they threw black people out of political office. The Klan, armed struggle, you know, military force drove black people back into desegregation, disenfranchisement, you know, segregation. And then you had the turn of the century, you have Jim Crow. Right? Where they said, we're not going to deal with race anymore. It's too much of a hassle, but you're here today. Right? We're going to let Southerners handle Southern problems. And if they think it's necessary to oppress the black population to keep things in order, that's OK. Right? How do you pay for that? Well, you know how you pay for that? When white immigrants come over in the 1880s in large numbers, 14 million from 1880 to 1920, right, what they learn how to be is white. They're not white in Europe. They're Italians, they're Germans, they're Poles, they're Irish, they're Jews. When they come to America, all of a sudden there's something called white. And they say, look, in America, regardless of how low you fall, there are black people up underneath you. So you know where you're better off when, when there's no black people around. Right? Or if they're around, you're stepping on them. That way you know you're not the bottom. And white immigrants, by and large, bought this. And they established organizations that were segregated. Trade union movement, American Federation of Labor, right? the Brotherhood of Railway Trainmen, conductors, firemen, maintenance away, whites only. Plumbers unions, whites only. Mechanics, whites only. Firemen, whites only. Policemen, white only. You know. To this day, there are only three, one, two, three, black people in the electrical unions in the state of Massachusetts. One, two, three. A legacy of that. We're not even going to talk about police and fire departments. We know about those. They're in the papers all the time. White only. Right? What is this to cost to white people? You form an all-white union and go to negotiate a contract. I want $2 an hour. I got news for you. I'll pay the niggas a dollar. Uh-oh. Don't like it? Quit. I can get niggas in here for a dollar. OK, so OK, I'll settle for the dollar fifty. It just costs you some money. Racism costs you money. I want unemployment compensation. Niggas don't have that. OK, I'll pull that off the table, too. To this day, the working class in this country is the most poorly organized in the world. 
And it took us to the 1930s to get the minimum of social gains that every European working class had in the 1880s. National health insurance, we don't have. Workman's compensation, unemployment compensation, social security had to come to the 1930s. Why? Because every time white people ask for it, they say, black people don't have it. You want them to have it? They say, oh, no, no, no. So they didn't have it. People hurt themselves. Right? White workers took jobs that were hazardous because they were white jobs. The best example is working in textile mills. You know, North Carolina, 1920s, textile mills, big looms, huge looms, whole room, big as this room, white job. Right? No child labor laws. Who works in those plants? Young white kids. What is their job? To crawl up under the loom and take the knots out. What happens when you do that? You pull a knot out, the machine moves, the kid is crushed. Thousands of needles in their bodies and they die. That's a white job. Black people aren't allowed in those plants. Where are the young black kids? Going to school. Can't get a job in the factory. Send them to school. Racism is costing white people. White Southerners are sending their kids to work. Black people are sending their kids to school because they can't get in a racist factory. Who's hurting who? Who's benefiting from that? And then they finally unionize. They make a movie, of course, Norma Ray, white person. We know that's not true. They didn't unionize those mills until they brought black women in there in the 1930s. It's black women that said, we're not taking this. They said, no, no, we always take out the trash. No, no, this says work these machines. Ain't nobody no trash. And by the way, my husband's in the yard. He's not making no money, so we're going to talk about that too. You know, white women organized the textile workers in North Carolina. Black women did. And the white women dragged along behind. Of course, they make the movie. They're not going to put no system in that. Henry Berry is not going to play no union organizer. <laughs> Right? So y'all think that Noah Murray organized all them people. No. Racism costs you because you don't know what's going on. Right? You're confused. Right? How does this affect policy in this country during the 20th century? Those same white politicians that got the three-fifths representation under Jim Crow, they got all of us discounted. If I'm Eastland or Bilbo, Strom Thurmond, and I want to run for office, what's the population of my county or my state or my congressional district? 60% black, 70% black, they can't vote. There's a literacy requirement, but that means illiterate white people can't vote. There's a poll tax, poor white people can't vote. What is my constituency? Five to 10% of the people in my congressional district. Who's that? Me and my cousins. <laughs> and you wonder how I got seniority in Congress. There's nobody can run against me. There's not an immediate member of my family. And so white Southern congressmen dominated the Congress of this country for the first 60 years of the 20th century. That's why you have no social security, no health insurance, no public education money. No high standards for anything. That's why. Right? And that's why when they put in Social Security, they explicitly exempted black people. The two occupations that black people had when they brought in Social Security, domestic labor and farm labor were exempt from Social Security right, to the 1970s. Right? You think we're the only people that work on farms? No, the majority of farm workers are white. You think we're the only domestic labor? The majority of domestic labor was a white. In order to hold black people down, you hold down large numbers of white people. They haven't figured it out yet. You know, you can shut down any program in this country by saying it's good for black people. What about welfare? All oh, black people, black people. The majority of people on welfare are white. White. No benefits for them. No, no, they just laying up somewhere having babies. White women don't get benefits because of that. But to stop the program, you show a black face. That's why racism costs you. Show a black face, you stop the program. 
and they come tell you it's black people's fault. There's not enough money for education. Why can't poor white people get into school? Black people got all the positions. Very the action. Black people got all the spots. Now we looked around, you has got 2% black people, right? There's about 5,000 white people every year that don't get in. All of them swear to God it's because black people got their spot. <laughs> the reality is there's not enough money put in a higher education, right? The, we need doctors in this country. Why are people fighting for slots in medical school? The solution to the problem is to expand the medical schools, not have you fight for slots. If you have people that want to be doctors and you need doctors, expand the medical schools. Don't have, I could have got into Harvard, but a black person got in there. He wasn't qualified. <laughs> First of all, that's not true. But the fact is that both of you need to be doctors and on to the size of Harvard Medical School. That's the solution to the problem. But everybody is fighting over stuff at the bottom. Right? White people have yet to figure out that everybody in the world, black, don't have their spot. <laughs> right? Nobody's mad at George Bush. Anybody mad at the Rockefellers? Anybody mad at the Carnegie's? They mad at people on welfare. Oh, I'd, I'd be really well off, except those people on welfare got my money. <laughs> <laughs> The numbers don't even add up. The amount of money that goes into welfare is paid for by the bottom 20% of the tax bracket. Rich people don't pay for welfare. You don't pay for it. Poor people pay for themselves. Right? Whites have yet to figure that out. I'll give you two last examples to show you how this distorts reality. People are very upset, very upset about the war in Iraq. You have a right to be upset. They showed these people that got dragged out of these things, burnt to death. Some people were hung. This is outrageous. This is barbarian. Black people said, are they kidding? Have you ever heard of lynching? Yeah. There's a book called Without Sanctuary. Without Sanctuary. It is a collection from an exhibit of lynching postcards. There are at least 10 images in the book, more in the exhibit, of black bodies burnt. There are images of black people hung from bridges, a woman and her son. These images include rings and circles of large numbers of white people dressed up for the event, getting their picture taken with the body, and taking pieces of the suit of the body, burnt body, home for souvenirs. A photographer, of course, took a picture to sell to those people that missed the event. Therefore, the postcards, right? People bought the postcards who went to the lynchings and mailed them to their friends saying, oh, you missed our latest barbecue. Here's the nigger and his son that we burnt up, right? This country has no moral authority whatsoever to chastise any country on the face of the earth for barbarism. None whatsoever. That's the cost of racism to you. Right? You can stand anywhere you want and talk about freedom and justice and liberty and black Americans say, what about us? You got to sit down and shut up. That's the cost of racism to you. you know, that you're seeing worldwide as hypocrites. Now, if you deal with that and say, we acknowledge our past and are working on that past, then people say, at least we're ashamed of it and we're dealing with it. Right? But to not know it and to actively fight not to know it Right? It's one of the crimes in higher education. You know, when we start black studies, you said, we want to talk about the history of black people. Oh, that's propaganda. You think Washington and the Delaware ain't propaganda? Or the cherry tree? I mean, come on, or Lewis and Clark, come on. Or David Crockett and them, all that stuff. We're not talking about telling stories. We're talking about, let's, let's get this thing straightened out. You know. Let's get this thing straightened up. Yeah. It's 50 years since Brown. Americans claim they believe in equality and integrated education. They don't believe in either one. It's 50 years since Brown. Schools are neither integrated nor equal. White Americans, when they feel like it, can put somebody on the moon and send a spaceship to Mars. 
If they wanted to integrate the schools in this country, they could have done it. They didn't want to. My integrated school in, in Washington, D.C. lasted three years. 1956, went into high school, 20% black. 1959, graduated, 80% black. If white people didn't want integration, all they had to do was stay still. <laughs> then we couldn't have been 80%. We'd have still been 20%. There wouldn't be no space. As fast as we came in one door, they went out the other. And took the money, because the school is not equal. If they said, OK, we're leaving you the school, but we're leaving the money behind, then they could have gone. <laughs> then at least we would have had the equality side. <laughs> they didn't want integration or equality. And that's as true today as it was 50 years ago. You know. Who's hurt in this state? And I'll give you two examples in this state to close up by this. That recent report, funding for education in the state. People think that's about minorities. You know, schools in Springfield get less money than schools in Newton. Schools in Lowell, you know, Holyoke get less money than schools outside of Boston. Inner city schools in Boston get less money. They say, oh, it's about black people. You ever look at the figures for Orange, Athol, Gardner? Ain't no black people there. Wichington, ain't no black people there. Poor white people are suffering because of this. But if you make it a race thing, you don't even see the problem. Poor white people. Where is the money going? I teach in the prisons in this state. For 30 years now, every prison I've taught in has doubled in size. Brand new, double inside. Every last one is double in size the past 30 years. It costs forty thousand dollars a year to put somebody in a prison. Forty thousand a year. That means for four years, hundred sixty thousand dollars to go to UMass costs ten thousand dollars a year. I talked in Old Colony what six three months ago, Black History Month. I had an audience of hundred and fifty Black and Latino men. They're getting paid forty thousand dollars a year to sit there. Give me that money, I could have brought him out of there and put him in UMass for 10000 a year. Right? That's your money. That's why this school doesn't have more. The money that could go to education in this state is going to prisons. The majority of the prisoners are black and Latino. Right? You are paying for that. <coughs> Racism is costing you money. You can't get away from that. You can sit there and say, well, you got to lock them up. You're paying for it. Do you want the 40000 to go to them, or do you want it in this school here? You know, don't double the size of Old Colony. Double the size of Greenfield Community College. Right? If you can give them a $40,000 scholarship, why aren't you out here on free scholarships? You shouldn't pay any tuition at those prices. You know, one inmate will pay to what, tuition for four people here for a year? One inmate. Right? <coughs> but if you think that race is that important and that black people are that dangerous, or you fear them so much that you're willing to sacrifice your education to keep them incarcerated, you will stay dumb and they will stay incarcerated. And you will not solve the problem of racism. Right? And you can't say it's not your problem, it is your problem. You're paying for that. You're paying for that. That's the cost of racism. You know, racism is not free. You know, it's not free. Yeah. Now I'll leave you with that one. I won't give you the last one, which I forgot. And I'll leave you. If I think of it again, I'll give it to you. Uh, that should be enough to get the point. You know. The point is that historically, the way race, ha I didn't even talk about the war. The war was the last one. I didn't even talk about that. Uh, you know. You know, that the military can suck up millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars because the whole rest of the world is them. You know, that's how you pay for that. You pay for that. That's your money. Talk about money down the drain. <laughs> that is seriously money down. That is money down a rat hole. You know, if all you know about the rest of the world is that they hate us and therefore kill them, you won't have a penny for this school to be, you know, Westover Air Base will still fly them C-50. Every one of them planes costs five times this building. Every one of them, you know. Somebody can walk into Congress and get an aircraft carrier faster than you can get a library. You're paying for that, you know. And if you buy into the notion, right, 
that the holding on to a vestige of white supremacy is that important that you're willing to pay for it, then you will live in a world that will have war, more war and more war. You know, and the Civil War would look like a picnic. You know. The solution to this problem is to see in every human being on the planet yourself. Because you know. racism is the failure to look in the face of any other human being and see yourself. You know. If you can look into the face of any other human being, regardless of what they look like, size, shape, color, gender, you know, and not see another human being, it's the only way you can kill another human being. You know, or see them suffer. But if you look at the face you know, of a Venezuelan child, an Iraqi child, you know, a Bedouin man, you know, Moroccan woman, and say that's a human being, and you put down a gun. You say, let's talk. What is your problem? What resources do you have to offer me? What do I have to offer you? That's the world you want to live in. Right? But it begins with that stretch of imagination that says every human being on this planet you know, is entitled to what you have. And if they're not entitled to everything that you have, they're entitled to the right to pursue their lives to the fullest. Right? And they're entitled to the same respect you want for yourself, the same dignity you want for yourself. And if in any part of your life you cannot look at any human being and see that, you better check yourself. Check yourself. Yeah. Whether it's the ethnic group next door, whether it's Catholic, non-Catholic, whether it's somebody in a wheelchair, whether it's somebody you don't like their hair, you don't like their clothes. Yeah. If you cannot see in the face of every human being on this planet, every human being, regardless of where they came from, what their history is, if you can't see yourself in them, then this problem will continue. Listening to this video, uh, these young men giving their perspective, young men and women giving their perspective about uh, prejudice, racism, it is more profound that it, is, it has been done in Britain. Remember, Britain is the very country that colonized most of um, African countries. You understand? That's why a majority of African countries, we speak English. We speak English because we were colonized by the British. And the very British are the ones who uh, promoted racism. They are the ones who promoted colonialism. They are the ones who promoted slavery. So it's such a coincidence and such a nice thing that the young people of that specific nation that did all these atrocities are having conversation about racism, uh, black prejudice, and white privilege. You understand? Now, listening to what they are saying, you can tell that uh, these young people are, yeah, are open-minded. Uh, they are easily, um, they can come outside and speak their mind. It's not like the mind of their parents. You understand? People should know that generations uh, come with their own uh, perspectives. A generation comes with their own ideologies. For this generation that we live in, um, the Gen Z, the Gen Alpha, uh, the millennials, there is how we think of things, you understand? There is that generation which has been born in the culture of awareness, uh, like the internet. The internet has made the world become a small global village, so spreading awareness is very easy. Now, be, I, can't, I can't really think that, I can't really ask myself, how does Chinese people look like? I can just easily go to the internet, search around, and see, okay, this is how the Chinese look like. They have these features and that features. Now, instead of having that prejudice in your mind, the internet is able to show you this is how they look like, this is how they behave. Before you go to a place, the internet is able to show you this is how the place looks like, this is how it does not look like. It's different from where this video is shot. This video is shot in the 80s, yeah. Now, it speaks of the generations of the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, uh, what is happening here. You can see these young people have much awareness. It is true, it is true. When a white person sees a, a group of black people walking, they think that um, there is something wrong about to happen if it has not already happened. And when black people see a 
white people they fear they fear for their lives which shouldn't be the case people should live in harmony and in peace with one another that is what i believe is the best um a unity that is what i believe is the best uh, community uh, is the best form of uh, coexistence between uh, one people and another people these videos here to enlighten us on the importance of integration and debunking the stereotypes remove the stereotypes and keep the truth just like sherlock holmes always puts it if you remove the impossible whatever you are left with however improbable that that is always the truth my guys yeah that is what we are going to that is what we have seen here and i'm glad young people are able to come out and speak out just like what uh, people are experiencing right now uh, in kenya in africa around the world bangladeshis are uh, walking are uh, speaking out people are speaking out to the young people it's always been the young people who have been speaking out you understand it's always been the, been the young people we had these young people even in the times of the old bible yes david was young joshua was young um when moses fled egypt he was young everything was done by young people yeah and um the future of a country is its young people if you cultivate it you have a strong uh, culture if you don't uh, then um the country is fallen yes so thanks for watching this video it was a short one uh, if you value what we do here kindly give us a thumbs up we we'll shall surely uh, appreciate so see you in the next video and thank you for watching efk original documentaries give me a super thanks and subscribe see you in the next one